to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the lord said what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of Mark. We hope that you got your Bible handy as we're going to be studying Mark chapters 5 through 8 today in our overview of the Gospel of Mark. Such a powerful book about the majesty of Christ and we're excited about its teaching today. As always, we're so happy that you've joined us for our study of the Word of God today. We want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area, would love for you to stop by and visit their worship service, whether that be on Sunday or their Bible study on Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you to come by and visit with them. If you've got a Bible question, maybe you'd like to study the Word of God more or just learn about the church. Friend, they'd be happy to sit down with you, open up the Word of God, and study together. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we also want to help you in your study of the Word of God. We encourage you to visit our website thegospelofchrist.com we have a large variety of Bible study materials there whether that be videos or audio written material you can access that free of charge 24 7 on our website and you can actually get a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons from our website or by requesting those through our media request form we can send you a hard copy as well and in the day and age where people are moving so fast and things happen so quickly, we want to encourage you to check out our app for your smartphone as well, both on Android and iPhone. You can get those from the Apple or the Google Play Store. They're free of charge and they're a great way to study the Word of God on the go as well. Today we're going to be thinking more about the majesty of Christ. Remember that key idea about the life of Christ is found in Mark chapter 7 verse 37. He has done all things well. The majesty, the perfection, the, the power of Christ is seen throughout the gospel of Mark. And what a wonderful study it is in the word of God. As we direct our attention to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark today, we begin with a very powerful and intense scene of Jesus who now comes upon a demoniac. That is, a man who is possessed by multiple demons. And this man has had a rough life. Uh, he isn't in his right mind, we can tell that. He uh, lives in the caves and the graveyards. People have tried to chain him or handcuff him as it were. He breaks those chains. He's constantly crying out and cutting himself. He's got nobody to be around. He's just, if we can use the word, he's kind of like a lunatic in some ways or a crazy person. And so this man's just not right. He's possessed by all these demons and he's at war inside as it were. And now Jesus is going to come to this man. He's going to heal him. He's going to cast all those demons out. And when Jesus comes to this man and heals him and comes into his life, I want you to notice the state this man becomes in. Look in Mark chapter 5, verse number 15. The people come to Jesus. They've heard what happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion. Listen to this. Sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. What did Jesus do for this man? When Christ came into his life, when, he, when Jesus healed this man, cast all those demons out, look at the stark contrast to this man's life before and after contact with Jesus. Before he was a crazy man. 
before he was possessed by multiple demons and uh, unclean spirits. Afterward, he's sitting down. What? He's not running around acting crazy anymore. He's not naked anymore. He's clothed. He's talking and making sense. He's in his right mind. Look at the, the transition that happened because of coming in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it, it always perplexes me. The response of the people here, they're afraid when they see this. Now, prior to this, they were afraid of this man. And now they're afraid when he's made right. That again expresses the, the power, the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But friend, I, I want to drive home a really practical point here. I understand we're not living in the day and age of uh, demon possession in that sense and uh, things like the demoniac. That's not the day and age we're living in. But when a person whose life may be in shambles comes to Christ, obeys the gospel, and becomes a Christian, think about the before and the after. Think about your life. If you're a Christian, I want you to think about your life before Christ and your life after. The joy, the peace, the happiness, the harmony, uh, the forgiveness that's there, that only comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how this man was affected for good by the Lord and Savior. But this man didn't just let that sit. This man wants to now do something. He wants to be uh, active for Christ and, again, expressing a great love he had for the Lord. Look in Mark chapter 5, and I want you to watch what this man says. This man, verse 19, wants to go. He begs him, verse 18, that he might go with Jesus. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how He's had compassion on you. Friend, when you think about what Jesus did for this man and what He told him to do, He wants to travel with Jesus now. Of course, Jesus knows that doesn't need to happen for the man's sake, but also for this man's privilege to tell others. And so He says to this man, You don't need to be going around with me all the time necessarily, but I do want you to do something. You go home. You tell your friends and you tell your neighbors what great things the Lord has done for you and how He's had compassion on you. And friend, that, that reminds us of our mission, does it not? When my life is put back together, when I'm cleansed of sin, when I become a Christian, on the other side of that, what ought to be my goal and my mission? To go home to my friends and my neighbors and my relatives and my co-workers and tell them, look at what the Lord's done for me. Look at the love of God. Look at how much God cared for me, and He can do the exact same thing for you and in your life. Spreading the message of God to the people closest to us, those we love the most, ought to be the mission of every Christian, to spread God's good news to every person. Then as we turn our attention to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we're going to learn about a rather disturbing scene. John, the, uh, the, the pre-runner, the forerunner, the one who prepared the way for the Lord, is going to face his ultimate demise in John chapter 6. And basically what's happening here is he is placed before some dignitaries and, 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 and kings and, and there they do some things that are not right. And, and John points out that this man, Philip, should not have his brother's wife. Herod shouldn't have his brother's wife. And thus he's told, it's not right for you to have her. John took a strong stand for the teaching of Christ and the teaching of God on marriage. And it cost him a great deal. Look in Mark chapter 6. And I want you to see what the Word of God says in verse number 18. As John stands up to Herod, it says in verse number 18, John says to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He knew he was not living right. He knew that this marriage was not right, that they were living immorally. This was contrary to the will of God. And so John said, regardless of what it might cost him, John said, you're not living right. It's not right. God's teaching says you don't deserve to have your brother's wife. That's sinful, that's immoral, and that's ungodly. Well, how did that go over? 
not well at all. Eventually, this woman and her daughter are going to request the head of John the Baptist on a platter, as it were. And John loses his head over this teaching. But friend, John may have died physically, but how he ever lives and is a great hero spiritually. He stood for what's right. And that's the ultimate thing that we remember John about in so many ways. And friend, we've got to do the same thing today. Regardless of what moral teaching it may be, uh, abortion, marriage being between one man and one woman for life, Genesis 2 verse 24, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, whatever the moral issue may be, we've got to stand for right regardless of what the world or people in power may think. We've got to speak out against sin. We've got to speak the truth on marriage and the sanctity of that and the church and God's teaching. And, and regardless of what physical harm might come our way, standing for the truth, just like John did, is the greatest thing we could do to honor and glorify God. God we don't need to be spineless and we don't need to be standing in the back corner hoping somebody else will speak up. We need to stand out and say what God says, speak the truth, in love. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 15. But then I want you to see another picture of Jesus that is presented in Mark chapter 6 and this is going to be Jesus as he is here with his disciples and as he walks on the sea and just amazes Peter, the rest of the disciples. They see Christ, something coming. They think it's a ghost. Uh, uh, they then realize it's Christ. Peter wants to come out to him. He comes out on the sea. And I want you to see what the kind of the impact of this miracle is. Look in Mark chapter 6. I want you to look in verse number 50. And they all saw Jesus and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. You know, when I think of Jesus and the example He set here, not only does this express His power. Who can defy gravity and walk on water? It just doesn't happen unless you're God and you control the elements and the laws of gravity. That doesn't happen. But when He sees that the disciples are scared, that they're set on edge, that this is a little more than maybe their mind can handle, Jesus says, be of good cheer. Be encouraged. It is I. Do not be afraid. Here we see Jesus as a man of peace. Jesus' intent is not to scare or to cause fear or trepidation in the hearts of His disciples. He wants them to see who He is. And this clearly shows His deity. But He also wants them to see, I am a man of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. According to Isaiah chapter 6, they sang when He came into the world, they said, Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Luke chapter 2, verse number 15. And it is that one who is so powerful that brings peace and happiness and joy into our lives. Because of His power, He's able to bring that peace and happiness to each and every one of us, and we can have that as well. Now, as we think about Jesus' power, He's now going to turn His attention to some people of His day who think they have that type of power, who think they've got the power to tell people what to do religiously, and Jesus is going to try to show them that's not the case. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus is now going to deal with the Pharisees. And these Pharisees are so caught up in their tradition. They're so caught up in looking and acting and feeling religious and wanting everybody else to see them that way that they've missed the whole point, as it were. They have now created some of their own laws and traditions. They have this popular word, korban that if you say korban, you are freed from other responsibility. Going back to the old law, a man had his responsibility to take care of his father and mother, to provide for them, to see after them, to make sure they're taken care of. But if you had planned to do that, but instead you'd like to take what you might have saved to take care of mom and dad and maybe give it to the temple, all you've got to do is say korban. And magically somehow, 
that frees you from the responsibility given by God, and now you're looked up as one of the more religious elite of that day. And Jesus says, that's not the way it works. You can't just say something and that be the law of God. Look in Mark chapter 7, and I want you to notice the teaching of Jesus in verses 7 through 9. Jesus spoke about the hypocrites, and He said, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why? In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. And so they've got all these traditions, got all these things that have been passed down, and they now have basically made those into the law of God. And Jesus said, Hypocrites. You want to wash the pitcher and the cup and the outward, but on the inside, it's not what it ought to be. And Jesus said, you're worshiping me in vain because you're teaching as teaching from God the commandments of men. All too well, you reject God's commands and put man's teaching in its place. Friend, we learn a very powerful lesson about whose teaching really matters here. And that's God's. Man has no right to make up laws and to make up teachings and to make up doctrines and say, this is the way God wants it today. Uh, we have decided in this council that this is what God wants and you need to do that. My friend, that won't cut it with Jesus. Jesus said, you reject God's commands and put yours in and that won't work. The thing that, listen carefully, what mattered then and what matters today is, what does God's Word say? What does the Bible say? Not what's popular, not what some council decided, not what's in some church manual. That's not what matters. What does the Bible say? What has God and what has Christ said? And friend, when we start taking things we like or things we want or tradition, things that have kind of worked their way down through hundreds of years and start elevating those to a level of God's teaching, making people obey that to be right. We're not any different than the hypocrites of Jesus' day. If we can't find it in the Scripture, and if we can't go by it from the Word of God, then friend, we need not say, this is what God says, this is what you've got to do to be right. In fact, it's our Lord who teaches us in this same text that it's not the outward washing pitchers, washing cups, washing couches, washing up to the elbow. It's not the outward that's going to defile you. It's what's on the inside that defiles a man. Look at the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 7 in verse number 15. Our Lord says it this way, there is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And so it, it's, not, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles you, it's what's in your heart and your mind and your life that's going to defile a man. And so we need to realize that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 verse 7, and we need to make sure that our heart and mind are focused on the right things. All right, that key verse then. Mark 7, verse 37, after Jesus has made deaf people hear, after He has loosed the tongue of a man who couldn't speak, the people are amazed. And Mark 7, verse 37 says this climatic statement about the life of Jesus. Listen to this. He has done all things well. They were astonished beyond measure saying, He's done everything well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Think about the life of Jesus. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. He committed no guile, nor was deceit or sin found in His mouth. 1 Peter 9, 2, 19 through 21. He was perfect in every way. Everything Jesus did was the, 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 the climax or the best it could be done. His life is the premier example of how to live. And thus, 
What a great summary statement of our Lord's life. He's done all things well. Friend, that's somebody that we can get behind and follow, live for, and look forward to being with for all eternity. Then as we turn our attention to Mark chapter 8, Jesus here is going to be seen as a great man of love and compassion. We see the power. We see the majesty. We see the miracles of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But friend, I also want you to see the love of Jesus as well. Look in Mark chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse number 2. Jesus sees the multitude, and here's what He sees. He called His disciples and said to them in Mark 8, verse 2, I have compassion on the multitude, because they've now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And so basically, Jesus from a, a few loaves of bread and fish is going to feed 4,000 people, later 5,000, great examples of that. But here's what I want you to listen to. Jesus looked at that crowd who'd been listening to His spiritual teaching, and He said, I love them. I have compassion. The word compassion carries the idea of love great strong feeling of, uh, of adoration as it were or, or a connection to them. I love them. I've got compassion on the multitude. Friend, don't get me wrong. Mark definitely wants us to see the power, the majesty, the deity of Jesus. But interspersed in that is His love. Seen in His forgiveness, seen in His healing, seen in His feeding those who had been following Him and were hungry. Don't miss, as you study the life of Christ, don't miss the love of our Lord. God so loved the world He gave. John 3, verse 16. It is the love of Christ that compels us. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 clearly teaches that, verses 14 and 15. When I think about all the things that motivates a man to serve God, the love of God, the love of Christ, the fact that He came to this earth, that He went about doing good, he's done all things well, that he ultimately went to the cross, suffered and died and hung in agony for me. Friend, you can't begin to imagine love any greater than that. And so we see Jesus also as a man of compassion. But I want you to see that Jesus is now going to teach that we need to have the proper priority. Jesus is also a man of proper priorities, and we see that in Mark chapter 8. I want you to look at the words of verses 36 and 37. Jesus says in verse 36, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, there's one very powerful lesson that we need not miss here, and it's this. The single most important thing that you possess is your soul. There is nothing more valuable than your eternal soul. God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Genesis 2 verse 7. That soul is one day going to return to God. The Bible teaches in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 9 and 10, and your soul, your spirit, your soul, is one day going to live somewhere forever, either in heaven, in bliss with God, or in hell, in torment with the devil. And friend, eternity is forever. This is the temporary side. Eternity is forever. Making sure, this is what it's all about. Why am I here? What's it all about? What's life all about? Friend, this earth is a veil of soul making. We have our opportunity right now to prepare to live with God for eternity. And Jesus asked the question, if, what if you gain the whole world? What if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Let's say that you could have all the wealth in the world. I mean, you're the richest person who's ever lived. You've got more money than Bill Gates and Ross Perot and the richest people in all the world combined. You don't even worry about money. You've got the finest things ever. But on the day of judgment, God says to you, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. 
I never knew you. Friend, what would all that stuff and money and junk amount to in view of your soul being lost for eternity? Or, as the Lord says in Mark 8, verse 37, what are you going to give in exchange for your soul? It's not as though you can say to God, hey God, I've got a bank account with seven zeros in it. I'll trade that for my soul. I've got this big bar of gold. I may not have lived right, but I'll give you that. God didn't need your money. He doesn't need your gold. All the stuff and things of this world won't amount to anything if you lose your soul. And so the main priority, your, my main priority, your main priority, our main priority in this life is to prepare our soul to live with God for all eternity. How you do that? Well, friend, the only way to prepare is to become a Christian. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. The Bible says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. The only way to prepare Get your soul right. Take first place the things that are the top priority, put them in the right order, is to make sure you're a child of God. Are you a Christian? Have you heard the good news of Jesus Christ, that He is the Savior? Romans 10, verse 17. Do you believe that the Lord is Lord of Lords and King of Kings? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin? And turn to God in repentance, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you acknowledge with your mouth, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, would you confess before men that Jesus is Lord and Savior? And would you do what the Bible says, to be forgiven of sin and to be saved? Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. And Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. We're hoping and praying today that your priority, your main emphasis in life is to live with God for eternity. We encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study more from the Gospel of Mark. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.